In this video, we'll talk some more about flip-flops and two important examples of sequential circuits, which are registers and counters. So remember that flip-flops are a one-bit storage element, just like latches are. The primary difference between a flip-flop and a latch is that a flip-flop is a edge-triggered device as opposed to the latch, which is the level-triggered device. Both flip-flops and latches are important sequential storage elements that we use in different applications. However, flip-flops are by far the most common element with, se with synchronous sequential logic. Now there are three main types of flip-flops. A D flip-flop, a T flip-flop, and a JK flip-flop. A D flip-flop is probably the simplest to use, and the table, the condensed next day table for a D flip-flop, looks something like this. So whatever the D input is, on the next clock edge, in this case I have a positive edge or a rising clock edge flip-flop, the value of D is what becomes my next state. For the D flip-flop, I like to think of this as like a data flip-flop, D standing for data. The T flip-flop also has one input, and the next state table looks like this. If the T input is a zero, the flip-flop simply maintains its state, and if the T input's a one, then I'm going to invert the state or toggle it. So this is an easy way to remember the functionality of a T flip-flop is that it is a toggle. It is the toggle flip-flop. And then the third flip-flop has two inputs, J and K, and a next day table. So for the JK, there isn't an easy acronym to remember this one, but you can remember that the JK has two inputs and is very similar to an SR latch or an SR flip-flop and the toggle flip-flop. So when the input on JK is 0, 0, I simply keep the same state with 0, 1, just like I have with an, with an SR flip-flop. I'm resetting the state to 0. 1, 0, I'm setting it high. And then for 1, 1, with an SR latch, this was a forbidden state. We don't use this that particular input combination. But for the JK, 1, 1 does the same thing as the toggle flip-flop and inverts the state. Now, for all of these flip-flops, we also have a choice. They could either be positive or negative edge triggered devices. In general, when doing sequential design, D flip-flops can be a very easy choice for our storage elements in creating the circuit. T flip-flops tend to be very handy when creating counters. And then the JK flip-flop, because of its additional functionality, can tend to simplify the combinational logic included with our combinational circuit. And I can see this if I draw the excitation tables for these flip-flops. The excitation table tells us, given I'm in a certain state and I want to get to another state, what are my input combinations to make that transition happen? So for a JK, if I'm in state zero and I want to change to state zero, I could either have my JK inputs both be zero to maintain my state, or I could do a reset, have zero, one, so in my excitation table, I would mark this down as 0x. Going from 0 to 1, I could either toggle 1, 1, or I can set. So this would be 1, don't care. Going from 1 to 0, I could either reset or toggle. Don't care, 1. And staying at 1, I could either set or maintain the state, so x, 0. For the T flip-flop, my input will be zero except for when the states, the next state is different from the current state. And for the D flip-flop, it's pretty straightforward. Whatever the next state is, that what's, that's what my D input has to be. From the next state tables for these flip-flops, I could also write a characteristic equation. So for the D flip-flop, whatever my D input is, that's my next state. For my T flip-flop, it's simply the XOR of my current state and my T flip-flop. So I'm using an XOR essentially as a controlled inverter here. So whenever the T is a zero, I maintain the state, and when it's a one, I'm toggling the state. And for the JK, I can do a little K map to figure out the characteristic equation. So 
So an important thing to note here is that you do not need to remember these characteristic equations or their excitation tables. I would recommend learning the functionality of each flip-flop type, and it's easy with these names, the data, the D flip-flop, the T flip-flop, and the JK flip-flop. Then it's easy to derive any of these tables, the next state table, the key one at the top here, and you can derive other expressions and use these within your sequential designs. Okay, so now let's talk about two important examples of sequential circuits. which are registers and counters. Now, just like for combinational circuits, we had some basic building blocks which are really important, things like the multiplexers, the decoders, full adders, adder circuits. For sequential logic, we also have some important building blocks that come up in many different applications, and those are registers and counters. And registers are simply a group of flip-flops used to store data, plus typically some combinational logic to move that data around. Counters also are built using flip-flops and do what you'd expect them to do, which is count. So with each clock pulse, a counter goes to its next state in some predetermined sequence. So let's talk a little bit about registers. So a register is just a group of n flip-flops, usually d flip-flops, that we use to store n bits of information. So typically, registers have some common inputs. So they usually have a common clock, a common clear signal. So when this input goes low, if it's an active low input, all the flip-flops are reset asynchronously, meaning that independent of the clock, as soon as the signal changes, it will force all the flip-flops to clear their signals. So this can be useful for clearing the register to all zeros prior to actually using it in clocked operation. They also typically have a common load signal, and so the register will keep its current state as long as its load signal is not asserted. There's also different types of registers coming in different flavors, so I could have a parallel load register, many different types of shift registers, bidirectional shift registers, and also a universal register. So say for example I wanted to construct a shift register And specifically, let's create a logical shift right. So I have some serial input. Every clock cycle, a new bit comes in. And I want the bits to shift to the right every clock cycle. So I'll simply connect together my D flip flops like this. And then at any given time, my flip flops hold the 4 bit value. Shift registers have many very practical uses. They can, for example, be very well suited for doing serial to pair parallel conversion. When I have a stream of bits and I need to save these bits and then pass them on to another digital circuit that takes a parallel value. Let's do another example for a parallel load register. So with a parallel load, the register bits are loaded simultaneously with a common signal clock pulse. So all the information, say for example 1011, is available for all the bits of the register, and they can all be transferred simultaneously during one clock pulse. So this is probably pretty obvious, but now let's say we wanted to add a control line. So when load is 1, I load the input value, and when load is equal to 0, I'm going to hold or keep the current value, not make any changes in my flip-flops. So one solution that you first might look at doing is something called clock gating and simply keeps the same circuit, but now I'm going to and the clock with my this load signal. Now this may work for small circuits, but in general, don't do this. Clock gating is bad, and the reason for this is that as I scale up my circuits, and remember I have propagation delays for these circuits, and if I have different types of circuits and different variations in these circuits, I'm going to lose the ability to implement synchronized sequential logic correctly. And in fact, we have a name for when this happens, when we lose synchronization, and the clock timing becomes off, 
and this is called clock skew. A better solution is to use gates on the flip-flop inputs. So say for example I wanted to design one stage of my parallel load register. So this simple circuit, first of all, each D flip-flop will have the same clock unmodified, and the D inputs will be this simple two-level circuit, where if load is a one, then whatever my parallel load is, that's going to be the next state. And if load is a zero, then whatever the current state is, that will be my next state. Note that this is also essentially just a two-to-one mux.